Hello, story seekers. I'm Nico. I'm Ben. And welcome to the Tiny Bookcase. Right now, you're listening to our favourite part of the week. Stories, discussion, and a high likelihood of gratuitous obscenities, all to sate the hunger of the bibliomancy Yesteris. Regular listeners will know how it works, but for newcomers, Nico and I have both written a story to the same shared prompt. We're about to share those stories with each other and you for the first time. Then we'll workshop them on mic. The prompt for this episode is menu. Ben, don't forget to ask about the specials. Menu. Where is that waiter? Dad clicked his fingers at the empty restaurant, making me giggle. When he gets here, what are you going to order, Tiger? He pointedly looked at the menu, so I quickly picked it up. Brushing the dust off the laminated paper, I copied the way Dad held it up for inspection. The letters were fancy, and the words alien to me. It had taken Dad a long time to teach me how to read. I wasn't bad at it, he just said that he didn't know how to teach it. No one did. Ratat wee lee? I took a swing at saying it. I was always supposed to try first. Ratatouille. Lots of vegetables, all cut up finely and stewed. No rat. No rat. Dad opened his rucksack and rooted around in it whilst I read on. Albergini Parmagana. What's that? Aubergine. It's a funny looking vegetable. The other bit means cheese. Probably fromage. He grinned. I groaned. Lots of vegetables on this menu, I noted. Meat got pretty scarce towards the end. The animals required a lot of care and a lot of land. No one wanted to rear them. You're not supposed to say that, Dad. I chided him. After all, he'd promised. Sorry. Not the end, then. Just before the balk. Dad produced two tins and set to work opening them with the tool we'd found in the restaurant's kitchen. He passed an open tin to me. There we go. One ratatouille. His smile always made me smile, but I saw that the twitch in his arched eyebrow was getting worse. I looked away and tried not to show my worry as we ate in the silent restaurant. I wondered what the place might have sounded like before the balk. The bones of the last dinner crowd lay where they'd fallen, Like the rest of the 80% that had gone down to the Bork of 52, no one had been able to bury them all. So places like that restaurant just got sealed up. 7.76 billion people. Dad had explained it to me by saying that if I tried to count the number of people that had died in my head, I'd be doing it for nearly a thousand years. The ones that survived the Bork were a mess. It had made sense, Dad said. The advent of fusion energy removed the divide between the haveurs and the haven'ts in the world. Tech turned to what Dad called quality of life improvements. Want to learn to cook like a famous chef? Write a symphony? Do complex astrophysical equations? All you had to do was install the skill on your chip. Dad had a habit of scratching at the small scar behind his ear, where it had gone in the day he was born. I knew it gave him pain now and then. Skill softwares had led to experiences, which had led to QPCs, quantum personality constructs. I struggled to imagine being two people, but everyone back then really was. My mother was Catherine the Great. Dad was Napoleon. He said it was like a bad tattoo. After a while, he regretted the choice, but never bothered to uninstall it. No one went to school because there were no schools anymore. Humanity had been hacked and they excelled. Dad says that no one really knows what caused the Bork, but all at once those little chips fizzed, killing some, ruining others. I was among the first to be born after the Bork. Dad says it was the best and worst thing he's ever done, cutting me out. But she was dead and he said I had to live. I looked up from my can of off-colour baby carrots to see Dad's features had frozen in a grim mask of twisted genius. One eyebrow was raised as if in sneering surprise. You could have marched an army over the bridge of his nose. I sighed and began picking up our things. It was happening more frequently. He stood up as well and began to pace the restaurant with his hands behind his back. 
I slung his backpack over my other shoulder and saluted. Emperor, we must go this way. He paused, staring at the dilapidated boards which braced the window of the restaurant. I wondered what he saw on that imaginary horizon. It is so, he whispered sadly, following me out into the slushy snow of the streets. We passed no more than a dozen scavenging valleys as we walked up the strand. Most were made up of kids like myself, leading their damaged parents by the hand around their ruined city of cathedrals, banks and museums. We exchanged nods. Whatever the world was that we'd inherited, it was ours to care for now. I turned our path towards the river, skirting Trafalgar Square, and then on to the crisis housing in the palace. Behind me, Dad stalked as though he were being battered by Siberian winds. I remember wishing he'd reach out to hold my hand, like I'd already known that he'd been lost. But I didn't know that our time in the restaurant was the last conversation I'd have with my dad. Didn't know he'd never come back from the balked construct that dominated his chip. If I had, I might have asked him more questions about the menu. He always loved trying to teach me things. That's a really interesting concept. Okay. So, um... Are you aware of the feet, MC Anderson? Uh, again for me, sorry. Uh, so it's a book by someone called MT Anderson. It's called The Feed, and it's got mm. a kind of similar starting principle of the uh, the chips in the brain to give you internet access and all that kind of stuff. And um, I, I, have you mentioned it before on this podcast? Does it open with I a plane think, crash? Uh, it doesn't open with a plane crash, but I think I may have mentioned it before. So a lot, a lot of love for it. Okay, right. Go on. Sorry. Go on. But it's um, it's interesting. How, knowing that you haven't read it, it's interesting that you got to that same sort of um, uh, sort of pseudo uh, that they having the personalities of historical figures, because in in this book, they are genetically replicating them. So one of the main character's friends is called Link, and he's a genetic clone of Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> but living in the modern world. Um, so it's, sort of... it's really cool to me that there, that parallel was in there. Mm. Um, yeah, so, I, mean, I guess that but... one's like a nature versus nurture, isn't it? If it's like a genetic yeah. clone, it's to see what they would do. Whereas in this situation, it's more like a snapshot of who people think they were. Yeah, of, of the of the narrativized version of them, exactly, which is even yes. more interesting. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you, it's the, it's the heroics. It's the 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 idealized the, the history written by the winners version of people which is fascinating yeah i'd love to know if anyone ever got christ put in that would be <laughs> that's a good yeah that's a good uh, that's a good way to take it i think but it's, i guess um... i could have gone a bit a bit mad with seeing all the other parents wandering around after their kids like like you know making them have like mannerisms that might indicate who they were i, I can't remember who it is who has the bit about it the um going to going to a support group for people with delusions and there being multiple Napoleons all sat there <laughs> talking to each other about how they were Napoleon. <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, but, but I mean, before we go into sort of breaking it down a bit, the no rat in Ratatouille joke at the beginning, really nice, really sweet, mm. lovely moment between the two characters. But that, yeah, I, I wrote that one down because I really liked it. Um, it's simple, isn't it? I mean, I'm sure that must yeah. have been done before, but it was just, it's those kind of uh, that makes it feel real yeah exactly yeah. yeah a bit of verisimilitude like the the dad joke as well the the fromage yeah the um i think that part's really interesting actually knowing the whole story as well because a lot of it obviously is french like saying mm -hmm. fromage so faux and fromage and talking about ratatouille and he has a, a knowledge of these things because it is all it's all french in his head um <laughs> The the idea of looking at a cyberpunk world after the fact, because, you know, this is a post-apocalypse, post post a cyberpunk future. So you've got um, loads to look back at. And I think I think you cover quite well what you need to. Um, I don't know about bork as a word, although maybe that's just because it sounds so much like bonk to me. I just kept imagining like someone dropped something and it made all the chips break. Yeah, I guess so, but it's a it's it's not a technical term, but it's a bit of slang, isn't it? You know, if if yeah. a bit of technology balks, it sort of it goes a bit haywire. Um, 
so I think that that was sort of deliberately, it was sort of deliberately a little bit jokey because that was what they called it, like rather yeah, so than the end of civilization. Yeah. yeah. So the um, so the whole thing is it's a really interesting analogy for dementia. Mm, yeah. Because that um, you know, not knowing when that person is going to disappear into being someone else, and often in real life it tends not to be uh, into being Napoleon Bonaparte. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, the a sort of personality scrubbed infantile version of themselves as the, the case often is mm -hmm. it's it, it's both heartbreaking and fascinating to watch that but with a an onus on the the sufferer of having done it to themselves uh, you described it in the story as being like having an embarrassing tattoo yes well, yeah every, everyone was getting personalities put in so we all did it and i think there's something so uniquely linked to how we are living now. I mean, I, as someone with tattoos, it's fascinating to me how commonplace, uh, especially hypervisual tattoos, like facial tattoos, mm. are becoming. Because they are often impulse, and it's uh, very much in younger generations, but it's, like, it's sort of becoming more and more normalised as we go generation to generation. And it is interesting to me, like, where where does that line then, like, what, what lines will be crossed by generations? When will it be our point to go, oh, that's a bit, that's a bit far, you know, when will we be that age? And... I, I'm actually getting the sense that there is a version of that already happening. Like, uh, I remember, I, I, I keep on hearing about how apparently, like, the, the latest generation, I'm going to sound really, really out of touch here, but... <laughs> apparently like the latest the latest generation are getting quite sort of like um radicalized towards religion they're, they're quite religious in the in the west anyway and Ooh. there's a, there's a lot of like zoomers or whatever they are who are also hyper christian Seems and very odd to me it yes it, it feels very odd for me because I, I i sort of felt that you know the sort of rise of atheism in 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 my generation and, and it very slightly in the one before mine as well was like a path of progress myself like I, you know yeah. i don't necessarily think of getting rid of religions entirely but like i think we don't necessarily need to have a sky wizard to do good things or be good to each other do you, uh, do you think this <clears> is linked to the the decline of uh not actual science happening but people's trust in science well, you know, everyone... there was, yeah there, there was that there's... period wasn't there where where people were sort of comparing belief in science to, uh, basically to being uh, the equivalent of belief in religion because people who didn't understand a lot of the things that they were believing in did so anyway without having yeah, done any of the research or learn any of the the you know, or looked at any of the data or or, or learn any of the like the, the theories themselves um so maybe but maybe it's just always the same thing maybe maybe people always need some some sort of faith um yeah Bit of a roller coaster that one. I think maybe yeah. maybe a bit too much to dig into right now. But like that was the one that unsettled me when I heard of it, heard about it. You know, you were saying like, "What's going to be our tipping point?" And I wasn't expecting yeah. a religious resurgence to be the one. Well, it's, if people could just accept that the world was flat and covered by a dome that the ancient <laughs> elf aliens built, <laughs> then we'd all be fine. So, <laughs> uh, just just for anyone listening, I don't believe any of that. <laughs> Please do not. Be, if someone clips that, I'll be <laughs> kind of thrilled. But yeah um i don't know i think we're we're reaching a, a, a stage of willful ignorance but i think almost as a method of self-defense yeah you, you can't really blame people can you like this it no. really is getting quite hard to lift your head up and look at you know sort of peek out of the bunkers we build up build for ourselves at home um, yeah, I wish I'd never taken the time to learn what anything political meant because all it's done <laughs> is made me unhappy. <laughs> it's made you really fucking angry. That's the one. <laughs> yep. But no, uh... I um, I really enjoyed it. I think it would be interesting to. So, ah, see, I was going to say, I think it'd be interesting to see the kid surviving afterwards, but it wouldn't. Like we know that story. I think it's more interesting to see. Uh, a man who believes himself Napoleon Bonaparte in a post-apocalyptic society. 
But... I, I actually agree with you. I think, you know, I yeah. said to you before we started recording that I felt like this needed a bit extra somewhere. And I think that probably is it. And maybe I like, was a bit gun shy with the Napoleon dad thing. Um, you know, I, I sort of tried to get in a bit of it, you know, like the that thousand yard stare and the and the you know, the march into Russia and things like that. I mean, yeah, um it's but it could do a, a bit more. Of, there's some really interesting stuff. You know, if you were to take you know, like someone's got I can't even really think of an example, they've got Long John Silver implanted. Mm-hmm. You got you know they can have fictional characters, and what if one you know wake up and find them soaring off their leg because it shouldn't be there? Yeah, that's the sort of stuff that they're like. I think you you'd probably need longer than our word count to do that credit unless that was the only thing. Like you know, yes. you did old patient study. This man believes himself to be Long John Silver, and one morning you find him chopping off his leg and jamming a mop pole up it or something. But yeah, I mean, you'd also have to build. A, a narrative and an a, a emotional sort of context around it as well. Again, wouldn't you? Yeah. So I think you're right. I think you need more words than that. But focusing in on um, a bit more of the Napoleon stuff potentially. Um, I, I I don't dislike it in its current form. It's about 900 oh. words or so. It's pretty tight. Um, yeah. Any anything else that uh, you think you would you would change or add? I think the only way you could really alter it is a change of perspective. I think it's quite clever at the moment for word count to have a lot of it sort of filtered through a child lens because it means you don't need to over explain things you have their understanding of it which is enough because if it wasn't enough it wouldn't be the version of it the character had been taught Mm -hmm. yep i think if you switch obviously you can't really switch it to the dad because otherwise at some point he looks at his he turns away from his son and then looks out across an ocean although that's kind of interesting it would be that would work better, I think, in a visual medium. Yes, yeah, I do. I actually that's that actually touches on a bit of a nerve for me. Um, I do occasionally write something, I think, oh, that's good, and then realise that potentially it would be better <laughs> on on a television or on a big screen, and just like, oh, it's 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 sort of interesting to know what's going to work well just written down i think you know because yeah we there are so many you know we get so used to seeing um adaptations of things don't we um yeah. that the, the comparison is often uh very immediate like you know we've been talking a lot about june recently for example and i just said that you know on the last episode i've just finished um I'm, i've just started reading um uh not children of june is it god emperor of june christ yeah no it's i'm deep into it now but like Comparing those books to the movies that Denny Villeneuve's made, you can see where it's similar and you can see where it's distinct. And there are bits in both that are better because of the medium that they're in, is my point. Yeah. But you can um, see that they're different and you can see why. I think that's the big point, isn't it? I think so, yeah. Um, and I sort of wonder, the reason I say it's touch nerve, I, I do sometimes wonder if I like all my wires are all crossed up and whether I'm... <laughs> I'm, I'm so into TV and movies and also into storytelling and, you know, we do a lot of like role-playing storytelling as well in TTRPGs. Yeah. Um, I, um, I, yeah. I sometimes have a similar thing and I wonder if it's because we're so used to describing scenes to each other in games that we we forget that you need that step. Like, as you're saying it, my brain's going, oh, yeah, and he's turned, and I bet he's looking out over a huge naval battle. And it's Mm. not in the words, but I'm doing that for you. So I think, so long as it's like people are thinking in the the right way, it does still work, but it would be really satisfying to see that played out in a visual (laughs) medium. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I get you. Okay, well, I think that's, you've given me a lot to think about there. I so uh, get some get some investors and start shooting. I think yeah, just get get a few mil, get Joaquin Phoenix back to reprise his role as Napoleon, but as <laughs> Dad Napoleon. Sorry, Joaquin Phoenix as Napoleon, but Dad. <laughs> that I bet he would do that. Yeah, <laughs> just he's, he does take weird roles. Do you know what? You're not wrong. <laughs> Just get straight off of Joker, folly idea, straight into Napoleon, dad. It's a 10 minute short. It's brilliant. Is that what they've called it? Uh, oh, yes. Folly idea. Right. Okay. Yeah. 
Which Martin Scorsese are they ripping off this time? I, I don't know. Has he ever done a musical? <laughs> <laughs> no, he only makes good movies. Oh, cutting words. <laughs> Menu. I have this recurring dream. I'm in a restaurant that I don't recognize at all. It has those real old school tablecloths. You know, the, the red and white checkerboard type ones? They got them in every deli. I, I don't know, they make me think of being a kid. They're like default tablecloth. Well, they don't fit in this dream restaurant at all, but that's what my brain puts there. Everything else there is real fancy. The walls are white, the fork is so polished that it's glowing, but they have these old diner tablecloths. Anywho, I look up and opposite me every time is a different broad. Sometimes it's someone famous, but really old school, like uh, Fay Ray or Ingrid Bergman. And they're in black and white too, just sat there looking and sounding like a motion picture. We don't say much, we just make light forgettable chatter. Uh, it's the same when it's chicks I've dated in the past, or, or worked with, or... On rare occasions, those cousins so far removed, you only meet them at funerals. Like when a great aunt dies. Those are fine, right? Cousins in name but not nature. And it's only a dream. So anyway, I look up from the tablecloth, and my dinner guest for the evening is sat there, and I'm nervous something fierce, and we chat, and they smile, or maybe they don't, and that's worse, you know. I can't hear my own voice, so I don't know what I'm saying wrong. But now Audrey Hepburn or Sandra from accounting is frowning and staring into their glass of Prosecco and I know it's not good. I, I know it's a dream because I've had it so many times now. I, I try and influence what's going on, you know? Like, I might try and play footsie with whoever I'm sat across the table from. Except I, I can't lean to the side and those red and white checkers are in the way, so... I don't know if I even have feet, or if she has feet, maybe we're just a pair of torsos, just waiting, just just waiting for the waiter to come. Now, now the waiter is, is tall, not like too long or whatever, but it's, uh, it's, it's like being a kid and looking up at an adult. Sometimes I look up and I feel like it's my peewee coach, or sometimes it's my pops even. And those nights are okay. Pops will say, I know what you want, chicken parm. Or my coach might say, orange slices, that's what you need, kiddo. You know, tousle my hair, which I'm assuming I have. I, I can't see that either, but no, no one's tousling my legs, so I got a greater degree of certainty about that. So then they bring that out, and I eat it, and my date eats something which I can't see properly, because the, the middle of the table is it's full of schmutz. There's a vase with flowers, and, and there's these sauces, and there's a box of those cheap napkins to pull out of the side of the, of the metal box. But then there's also photographs of my college baseball team, and, and a, a small model of this statue we had in my college. It's this bulldog called Barnaby Bulldog. He was named after some hotshot senator who had invested big in the school at some point. Then they found out he was doing some questionable things with some ladies, and they knocked the statue's plinth down and just put the, the big brass bulldog off to one side. It was right underneath my dorm window for two years. Uh, so I can't see what she's eating. Anyway, that's my point. But the worst nights, the nights where it stops being a dream is when the waiter that I don't recognize comes. I'm ready for someone I remember fine to bring me something I recognize. Then I get that voice. It's not scary. It sounds just like anyone else, but old. Like 40 a day and a ten of whiskey for 60 years old. And it always says, Menu. And I just nod. I can't hear my voice, so maybe he can't either. And he, he lays it on the table, and he puts one in front of my date, and then he's gone. Gone with his face that sometimes it looks like a bully whose name I can't remember. And, and sometimes like this priest that I watch my pops and his friends beat near to death because he was hurting little girls. And, and him and the fellas, 
where we lived, well, they found out about it. And sometimes he looks like me, I think, like me, but the lines on my face are too deep, and I look real tired and pained. Uh, it's a real tough break to look at. And when I look down at the menu, it, it never makes any sense. See, sometimes it's things you won't be able to eat. It's rusted nails and coins, which come with a jus of innocence and a side of tender stem broccoli. Sometimes it's just yeah, it's garbled shapes. They look a little bit like food when you tilt your head the right way, but then they also look like uh, half-remembered times. They, they look like pops and moms screaming at each other because he took me along to see what him and the boys did. Or it looks like the coach taking me and his son back home to, to have a sleepover a while because I can't go home. And on some nights, it looks like Bonnie be the bulldog staring up at me. He growls this big metallic growl, and I watch this molten metal ooze out of his mouth, and he opens it so wide. And I'm six stories up, and I'm in my dorm, and I'm looking down at him like I always did. And this time, I'm going to jump. This time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. In these last few nights, it's, it's only ever been that waiter. And the menu's always said the same thing, and it's, it's never repeated like this so many times. I was getting so disturbed by the message and what it could mean that I hadn't even noticed who I was eating with. And this last week, I've been dream dating my mom, except she looks tired. She looks sad, even more sad than I remember. And when the menu comes, she, she smiles at me and I, I see this look in her eyes like she's begging me, understand, understand what I'm saying, except I can't hear her and she can't hear me. So I, I just read the menu and I, I try and order the, the only option that's left there for me. So tell me, what's it going to take for a fella to get an order of wake up? Okay, all right, that is fucking interesting, isn't it? That is quite, <laughs> that is quite something. That is quite something. Dreams are so tricky as a narrative device, aren't they? Because you and I have spoken about this before, how like yeah. they can often feel like quite like a cop out, but they don't when they are the entirety of the story. When you're in this, in this story, I'm assuming the guy is in a coma. Yes. Yeah. yeah, he, yeah. He, he jumped onto the big metal bulldog. J yeah. Yeah. I um I liked it a lot. It uh I'm struggling to not to not make comparisons in my head to the Sopranos. Um because I mean that's fair. <laughs> but, uh yeah, because it's that's all about like, you know, a uh a, a New Jersey mobster going to psychoanalysis. And there's yeah. lots of sequences about him describing dreams and occasionally you see them actually getting like played out and all the rest of it. Um but there was there was just something about this that was just more liminal. I think like what what led you to it? Do you think? I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure. I had this. It started off way more sort of silly and comedic. Mm -hmm. uh, it started with him looking at the menu and kept turning it over, and there was more stuff as it went. Like it started as the you know the Nando's heat scale. Oh yeah, it's yeah. like lemon and herb or whatever and then it gets like hot extra hot and then he turned it over and it was like the fires of hell the heart of the sun you know yeah, yeah. went on and on and i thought there's there's something in this kind of endless like liminal dream space thing and then as i started working the story out it was no it's it's something trying to explain itself to him through his dream that's that's where the story is and it meant i could still tell a story while Having it be super weird. I I liked it. You know, just in the same way that you mentioned that uh, that my story had reminded you of something. Like as I say, yeah. this has reminded me very strongly of The Sopranos. At some point, I'm going to get you to watch it, and you'll you'll see what I mean. <laughs> um, but uh, as ever, it was it was really really well written. It had such a strong voice. It your turn of phrases just they kept coming. Um, they're really good. The only bit that I thought that I didn't like flow very well was the um, the bit where he's like pondering whether or not he has hair in the dream yeah okay I, I think you've already dealt with that kind of quandary with the legs thing so yeah i think you're right yeah just but th that's a really minor point because it's all really well written um 
And my favorite bit, my, my favorite thing about the story is this almost like quite deadened perspective where it's almost like, yes, they, it is from this person's point of view because you feel like you're looking out of their eyes. But it does feel like from very early on, like you're that he's just like a few inches too far back, that there's a bit of a sort of um, nimbus of darkness around yeah. him. Um, and the fact that he's in a coma, that is, you know, that that is how that's often portrayed. So, <clears throat> and it's how I imagine it, that might feel as well, you know, that kind of, you know, you're not quite dead, you're not quite alive. You'd be yeah, pulled back think... from the brink of awareness. It's it's an interesting. I don't know if I got it quite right. I think the coma thing works. It's the, you know, him him having nothing that is subconscious to deal with, and having all these things that he's passed away and like filed and so I'm not I I can't deal with that. That's too much. Mm. And and therefore him not being able to be fully in it because he's filled it up with stuff he doesn't want to deal with. I think that's. Yeah, it feels almost like it's he's got nearly there, to solve, hasn't he? Like, yeah, that's 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 what it gives the impression of, which I think is, which I think does come across. I wonder whether this sort of like you know the waiter character and the way that their face keeps shifting as well. Yeah, I wonder whether it would be worth like pinning that one in place. It being the only one that doesn't change, like so. Yeah. What, sorry, not not the um. By that, I don't mean the dad or the the coach. Like they. They should definitely stay. I really enjoyed those bits. I think that was all that all flowed really nicely. But then when you introduce this waiter character, it's like this is the other. This is the you know potentially yeah. like quite scary character. I, I I sort of felt like the story was bucking me off a little bit when then that when that character also started to change their appearance. Yeah, I think I think possibly it should just be him with years on him. Yeah, him with years because on him is pretty good. That that's what that's what's trying to get through to him, isn't it? His his aging body, but yeah, I think I think maybe with with a few more passes, I might be able to. Especially, I think this is one of those ones that it needed someone else to say to me. I don't know about that bit. I don't know about that bit because it was it's quite hard to occupy the headspace to write it. Mm -hmm. So it's it, yeah. it needed a, a second pair of ears. So it's actually I, I'm just for funsies. I think after your feedback, I am going to go back and have another crack at it to see what I land on because it was yeah, it was idea. a fun one to write, mm. even though it was I'd say reasonably challenging. Yeah, yeah, I, I think dream sequences are are very hard to make feel any like anything at all. That's the, sort of the point of them, isn't it? That they yeah, then then they're not supposed to be real. You're supposed to portray them as not being real, whilst also giving the reader still something to invest in, and yeah. They are often not done very well, um, but that was that was good. You know, like I, I was very attracted to this persona and this point of view. I, I found it very charismatic and followed along with it. I was interested in what these bits meant. These yeah. you know, the curios on the table, the diner cloth is a really really nice mental image that you keep going back to in a in a very pleasant way. It was it was good. It was it was really really good. Um, I wonder whether, yeah, I wonder whether it, it sort of needed, like, as I say, him trying to, like, solve something, like, just a yeah. touch earlier. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, I think you're right. I think, you know, as I said, as I said about mine, like, <clears throat> I felt like mine wasn't quite there. And not in a bad way. I just feel like it needed something else. And I feel like something quite similar has happened to you here. I think we're both, yeah. we're both very much turned up with stories that are, like, the, the, with the heart and soul are there, but we need to sort of sketch in the the, the, uh, the structure around it a bit. Yeah, these are pre-refinement tales. Pre-refinement tales. I like that. <laughs> I like that a oh, lot. We're renaming the podcast to that. <laughs> After however many years we've been doing this. <laughs> yeah. What's, what, what a self-aware moment that would be. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Tiny Bookcase. Remember to subscribe, otherwise you're going to miss out on the future fun. Also, tell a friend. If you like this episode, link them to it. We'd be tremendously grateful. You can follow us on Twitter at Bookcase Tiny, Facebook at The Tiny Bookcase, and Instagram at Bookcase Tiny for updates. Speaking of supporting the podcast, well, magic can only take one so far. The Tiny Bookcase is supported by the generosity of its patrons. 
Those kind souls have really kept my belly full the last year. Let's cast a spell for them, shall we? For rich ginger tones on their scalp, let us cast the Orangi Hedondo spell for Scott Byrne. And for general fabulousness, why not the Ulala la Mother spell on Matthew McLaren? <laughs> How do you come up with that shit, man?